So I have a story today about Joanne Bland, and you might wonder about the day, and so I thought we should talk about the fact that tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. That, well, it's the day that we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And the person I'm gonna talk about was there during the Civil Rights Movement. So if we think of Martin Luther King Jr. as a leader, you can't lead unless you have folks who are committed to the cause to do the work with you. And so this is a story about one of those people. So Joanne Bland was a civil rights activist. And I'm gonna tell you a story of her life when she was quite young, in the 1960s. She was still just a child. She was one of the younger folks there on the days that we're gonna speak of. So, a little bit about her first. Joanne did not know what her grandmother and other adults in Selma, Alabama were so upset about. In school, she had already learned about freedom. She knew that in 1863, 102 years ago, more than that now, Abraham Lincoln had freed all the slaves. So why was her grandmother going over to Brown Chapel day after day for meetings about fighting for freedom? At the Methodist Church, songs were sung and plans were made. There was even a training. And they were, they were really serious about their training. They, they, they needed to make sure that when they showed up, they showed up as their best selves. And so they practiced getting bullied and getting insulted on purpose so that they could learn not to push back. This puzzled Joanne. Her grandmother's freedom fight involved being peaceful, keeping calm, and not fighting back. Hmm. So one day, Grandma told Joanne that they were gonna go down to Selma's downtown and get her new shoes. Well, she saw a pair that she liked, and what do you do when you find a pair of shoes that you like? What do you do? Yeah, I heard somebody say, yeah, you're gonna try them on, right? So she went and she tried them on. Well, they were too big. What happens when you have a pair of shoes that are too big? You give them back and you get the next size, right? Well, she went to do that, and her grandmother, she asked for a smaller size, but that store clerk said no. She demanded that they buy the pair that didn't fit because she said no white person would ever buy the shoes once Joanne's feet had been in them. So Joanne, as a black girl, had that experience. And then she kind of started to see what her grandmother was talking about. Well, they walked down to Carter's Drug Store, and through the window, she could see clean, shiny counter there at the lunch where children her age were treated to ice cream, served by a waitress. She wanted to sit there, too. Her grandmother said, when we get our freedom, because at that time, she was not allowed to sit there as well. Well. Joanne soon became a freedom fighter herself, and she was marching for black voting rights. And in February of 1965, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Selma to lead the demonstrators in a peaceful march. And some of you might know this, right? So there they were, and they were going to march. And, and as they expected, the police started to hit and arrest people. Joanne one of those children was arrested too. Well, surrounding Joanne in the jail were several familiar people, young and old, many from the George Washington Carver housing project where she lived. She wasn't scared. Even the children had known that they could be arrested. What might come next? Another step toward freedom. So, Joanne marched again on March 7th with several hundred people planning to walk more than 50 miles to Alabama's capital city, Montgomery. But the police, they would not let the marchers over the bridge. Can we have a couple of the slides? So this here is the bridge, and this is after that, and that is Joanne and another one of the uh, people who were marching. So they were trying to cross that bridge there, but that first day they were not allowed. The police came and they attacked them, and it was quite violent, some of them even riding on horses, and the marchers scattered. There was a lot of loud yelling. The next thing Joanne knew, she woke in a car with her head on her sister's lap, and when she woke, she realized that her sister had been hurt too. 
History remembers that day as Bloody Sunday. The next march to Montgomery happened two weeks later, and it ended with a rousing speech by Dr. King at the state capitol. Joanne was part of that march, too. What had happened to them really shocked some other Americans, and change started to come about. Well, Joanne Bland still lives in Selma. Okay? She has been working as a civil rights activist all of her life. Can we have the next slide? The times have changed, and she's found new ways to be a freedom fighter. In 1993, that is her, and that's more recent. That was probably around 2015. That's the same bridge, yes. So it's the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and this is the exact same spot, but it was about uh, from 1965 to 19, I think this might be 2015. I'm not totally sure. But there she is. She has worked all of her life. She co-founded the National Voting Rights Museum, and anyone can go there to learn about the events that happened in Selma, why the march happened, what it accomplished, and what remains to be done. Now retired from the museum, she also guides educational tours along the streets where she lived and fought for freedom in 1965. Can we get the next slide? And here she is, and you see now, she's on the stage, and she is one of the leaders. So there we were back in 1965. She was a child, and she was one of the people working. And she was following, right? They had some leadership. Other people gave speeches. Now she's there taking her place as leader, and a lot of young folks are in that room with her learning on that day. And that's our story of Joanne Bland. Thank you. Sister Simone Campbell is a Roman Catholic religious sister, a lawyer, lobbyist, and perhaps best known for being part of the Nuns on the Bus campaign, an effort to take the message about social justice to towns across the United States. In 2014, she was invited to give the Ware Lecture at the UUA National Convention, called our General Assembly. The Ware Lecture is a prestigious honor recognizing those who lead this country in anti-oppression, anti-racial efforts. Former recipients have included Martin Luther King Jr., Rollo May, Mary Oliver, Cornell West, and Saul Alinsky. Sister Campbell's talk was titled, Walking Toward Trouble. In it, she talks about how the real world of social justice is the willingness of each of us must have to put ourselves in places that are uncomfortable. And by doing this, creating more equality in the work we do together because we come to know the reality of what we are confronted with. Here is a short clip from her talk. When you walk towards trouble, you open, my experience is that I open myself to questions, to uncertainty, to risk, to knowing that I am not the measure or in control of the situation. It is critical in our world at this time that we have the courage to walk into doubt as much as we walk into faith. Because quite frankly, if we don't have doubt, we don't have faith. If the only thing we have is certitude. I mean, the, the absence of doubt is, with faith is certitude. And that leaves us in a very righteous position. Walking towards trouble means we're willing to open ourselves to the surprise, to the 100% who has a different story, to different perspectives. So the importance of being uncertain means that I live a life that is slightly disturbed, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> And a bit puzzling, it has led me to surprising places like here and now. But, <laughs> which is a good thing. But being uncertain, I really describe as part of my spirituality. I describe my spirituality as walking willing 
walking willing to wherever we are led, walking willing towards trouble, walking willing towards Congress. Now that takes some doing some days. <laughs> but walking willing in a way that means I am willing to risk and be present with you and hear your story. Now, I do know that our beloved Pope Francis, who I'm calling Pope Frank because I feel really affectionate towards him. It's pretty cool. He says two really critical things for this talk. One is that inequality is the source of all evil. Now, absolutely, absolutely. And where he's talking about that, he's talking about it in terms of economics. But I would also like to posit that in this walking towards trouble, if we come with certitude with folks who are puzzled and struggling, we bring an inequality of position, of view, that is the source of evil in that setting. Finances is one thing. Our attitudes of righteousness and certitude are another. And the second thing he says that I treasure deeply is that reality is more important than theories. Reality is more important than theories. Stevenson is a lawyer and he's one of today's living heroes. He's also been one of the UUA Ware Lecture awardees. In his book, Just Mercy, he describes the work he does in his legal practice. His legal practice is dedicated to the release of wrongfully condemned and in defending children and young teenagers who have been sentenced as adults. Brian Stevenson walks into trouble every day when he goes into the prisons and he learns the stories of the incarcerated boys and the men that he finds there. He has learned that the prison system has developed in the South as a way to extend the system of slavery and it is rife with injustice. In his book, in the recent movie that I'm sure a number of you, I hope a number of you have seen, they give haunting examples of men and women he has spent time with. And he calls for each of us to work to end the injustices of our system. In order to do this, he argues that the first thing we must do is to get proximate to those who are suffering or oppressed. And then along with getting proximate, we need to learn to rewrite the narrative never give up hope, and have to be willing to be uncomfortable. All four of these things happen together, but separately. So I want to talk some about this idea of getting proximate, because I think it's the same thing that Sister Campbell talks about when she says that we have to walk into trouble. This is something we see in so many of our religious leaders, our saints and our heroes. This, t this weekend, we're taking time to honor the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who became the face and the voice of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Reverend King walked toward trouble. One of his most famous writings is his letter from the Birmingham jail. And this letter was written as a response. He received a letter from a number of the white clergy in the South telling him to stay out of the South, that he was stirring up trouble and that he was not welcome there. And he writes back in his letter to say that Birmingham had the highest number of unresolved bombings of black businesses and churches in the country. He was going there because there already was trouble there. Reverend King went to the towns where people were not getting fair wages, where people were not allowed to vote, and where they were killed if they protested. He did not stay away from Mississippi 
or Alabama or Tennessee. He moved toward them. He got proximate and up close to the people who were suffering. Siddhartha, who became the Buddha, grew up as a sheltered and pampered prince who never saw human suffering. Then one day at the age of 29, he was outside his protected walls and came across someone who was ill. And then he saw an old person, and then he saw someone who had died. The story goes that he left his home the next day to seek enlightenment, distinguishing physical suffering from our souls. Most of the stories, to me, seem to skip ahead here, and they don't really examine what happened, but my guess is that Siddhartha left because he realized he could not stay isolated and aloof from the suffering of the world. In order to be a good prince, he had to understand the troubles people faced. He needed to get proximate to them, and ultimately, he developed a way to address the suffering of the world. And Jesus' story is similar. The reason Jesus was influential and so radical in his time was because he shared his meals with thieves and murderers. He hung out with people with diseases and with prostitutes. And he spoke with social outcasts like the Samaritans. Jesus was not seen as a holy man in his culture. He was viewed as a rebel who walked into trouble. When Sister Campbell talks about moving into trouble, she means that the hard work of fighting for justice is moving into the places where people are suffering and living hard lives. It's being in those places where people are living under highway bridges or in their parked cars. <clears throat> it's going into the spaces where people are spending their lives in prison cells. It's moving into the trouble at our borders where those who are fleeing for their lives are left stranded in refugee camps. So why are we told we need to do this? I mean, why should we get proximate to people who are struggling? Why does this seem to be such a religious theme? It's because it changes us. Once we get closer to people who are suffering, we are no longer dealing with abstract ideas, but with real people. We are now in relationship, and our understanding moves out of our heads and into our hearts. Last year, the day before Christmas, I met Marta. Marta was an 84-year-old woman who had left Guatemala with her three grandsons, traveling for weeks as they headed north. She spoke no English and no Spanish, only a Mayan dialect that none of us in the refugee shelter could even understand. Sometime during the journey, she was separated from her family. And by the time she came to us, she was alone, she had no food, she had no money, she had nothing, and she was freezing cold. And, and outside of the shelter, we have a, a, a clothing area where everyone can go and change their clothes. And every time I saw Marta, she had another layer of clothes on until she was really very, very puffy and could hardly move. After many hours, we were able to locate a niece in Washington, D.C., who paid for Marta's Greyhound bus ticket across the country to get her to the niece's home. But in order to get there, there were six bus transfers that this frail woman had to make, and she could not read or speak the language. She was scared. She had no idea if she was safe with us, and we literally did not have the words to comfort her. Knowing Marta, being with her for those two days changed me. Not intellectually, but something in me felt broken open, and I experienced a very vulnerable compassion. So I have to tell you the end of that story, even though it doesn't have anything to do with the sermon. <laughs> what we did is we made six paper bracelets, and we put them on Marta's arm. And each bracelet had the name of the town and the number of the next bus she would have to transfer onto. And then we demonstrated to her, like showing the bracelet to the bus driver, and hopefully the bus driver would get her onto the next bus. So it was with some trepidation we took her to the depot early on Christmas morning. 
and got her in line for the bus when suddenly we heard some screaming and yelling from the other side of the terminal, and it was Marta's grandsons who just by coincidence someone had found and brought to the station at the same time. Getting proximate to people living in troubled places makes me more aware of my social location. There's a degree of inequity when I do volunteer work, such as taking food to people who are hungry. I come from my place of abundance, giving a small portion of my time and resources. And don't get me wrong, it's not that I should not do that. We are all compelled to do this. But I also have to be aware of the inequity implicit in this. Getting in proximity helps us to recognize the dynamic a bit more and moves us closer to feeling some of the inequities of our world. In Cuernavaca, Mexico, I was sitting by the one room cardboard shack of a family of four who was squatting on some public land just a few feet from the railroad tracks. Welcoming me into their home, they offered me some tea. They used some sticks and just some scraps that they gathered around to light a fire to boil the water, and we sat on rocks around this makeshift stove. As we talked, the mother turned to me, and she asked what my home was like. Did I have more than one room? How did I cook my food? I honestly did not know what to say to her. At the time, Clark and I were living in a small apartment with very little space. Yet, we did have a kitchen and a bathroom and a bedroom that was separate. How could I compare my sense of inadequate living with where she was? I finally decided I would just tell her we had an oven and that I used gas for cooking. And she became very concerned for me. She was worried about how I would be able to pay for gas every month. This changed me. It was disquieting to describe the comfort of my home, the apartment I complained about that was starkly better than her cardboard room. And this discomfort broke me open. And as I had to sit in that camp, I was aware of all that separated us. Proximity makes us uncomfortable. This can be a physical discomfort as we sit on rocks around a campfire or go behind prison doors. And there's an emotional discomfort as we put ourselves in uncertain places. It challenges us out of our intellectual knowledge and security. When I was visiting inmates in the San Quentin prison, there were often times after the program just to hang around and joke, joke around with the guys there. And during one of these times, one of the inmates, Mike, told me how much he had changed from his time and experience in prison. He talked about his spiritual journey, saying he had entered prison as a 17-year-old punk. And now, 28 years later, he had learned an internal integrity and had come to find peace within himself. I didn't want to hear that. I tried to argue with him about the injustice of mass incarceration, the unfair sentencing, and the social costs of removing people from their families. I had my educated enlightenment about prison. But Mike countered my narrative by his spiritual journey, and he told me he would have been dead long ago but incarceration saved him from the street and from himself. Mike changed me. Getting to know Mike, developing a relationship with him made me consider things I was reluctant to even give credence to. I was pushed out of my intellectual righteousness and into a humble place where I was being challenged by him. The work of social justice requires us to be in relationship with others, to be part of the change. We move toward trouble. We move toward people. We move toward the trouble world. That leads us to a place where we change the narratives that we are told about the hom homeless, the migrant, the mentally ill, or the inmates, because we come out of our heads and into our hearts. We become allies or co-conspirators 
learning that instead of working for a cause or doing something for people, we are to work with them. It was Lila Watson, the Australian Aboriginal activist, who said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. This isn't just about saving others. It's about saving ourselves. We move into relationship with others so we can be on more equal ground, willing to be changed, willing to have our hearts broken open, willing to learn and learning how to build the beloved community we talk about. This is what Brian Stevenson is talking about. This is what Sister Campbell is talking about. It's the willingness to walk into trouble, to get proximate with the problems of the world so we can be truly part of the work of healing the world. Let us pray. Spirit of life, move in my heart so I can move in the world in a way that is vulnerable, compassionate, connected, and moves me toward loving the world and all who are here beyond belief. Blessed be. Our closing words today come from Brian Stevenson. I do what I do because 